yeah, that's me. Uh, I actually gave this uh, gave this talk last night in Lafayette. Well, actually, what was supposed to be this talk last night in Lafayette, I had this all done in a Jupyter notebook, and we actually did the whole command line shell hack it out type of thing. And uh, it turns out that most people's questions were uh, were not about how to actually do ACLs or how role-based access control works. Uh, surprise, surprise, a lot of people were fairly comfortable with that already. So I moved that piece to the end and we, we get to it. If you're super interested, you know, happy back, we'll spend more time on it. Uh, maybe I'll do a free code Friday or something like that and you guys can pick that up. So what I actually did was I kind of refactored the presentation to really focus on what's going on in the security environment uh, in total uh, in and around Hadoop. Um, I think if, if you looked, I actually said uh, for distributed computing, when you start factoring in things like Flink or Spark or uh, you know Yarn is still classic Hadoop, but there's so many things that people are doing these days that are, that are not Hadoop. Um, a significant, uh, there's a great example actually, a significant version of our customer base actually doesn't run Hadoop at all and they just run some supercomputing frameworks, things like Root, or they run an API framework like R, right? So a lot of different things are now going on in the distributed computing space, uh, leveraging context that initially started with Hadoop, but it's, it's well beyond Hadoop now, right? So um, role-based access control, we'll go through that real quick. Um, and then uh, the DFS ACL stuff, I actually moved to the end and then um, add-ons for Hadoop security, so these are kind of swaps. So I moved uh, the bottom one up to the middle and we're actually going to cover the Apache project Century and Ranger, so we get a look at those and then get an understanding of actually how they're integrating into the community. Uh, and then also how they're overlaying each other, competing with each other, however you want to call that, right? Uh, two different companies, one backs one, one backs the other, they're both actually acquisitions of closed source code. Uh, the two companies have brought to the to the community, so it's kind of interesting to see how they develop. Um, so, role-based access control. Uh, how many people in here have dealt with uh, with ACLs in some variety before? You see it in networking. We've done it for years in the Linux file system. Uh, anybody dealt with it to a significant extent? So, there's just some some groundwork framework that you want to you kind of want to get done. Um, there's some great, I mean, just like anything else, there's a bunch of security companies out there that are happy to come in and consult with you to tell you how to do this. Um, but really, it's, it's just a, it's a minor shift in your thinking, right? Instead of shifting from, or instead of really leveraging uh, users in their individual context, right? We actually end up leveraging roles and what the actual roles are that people fulfill inside an organization. So if you think about that, you know, you've got, uh, DBAs, you've got uh, administrators, you've got uh, analysts, you've got your data scientists. So you can figure, if you uh, if you take a look at a cluster, how that might break down as far as roles and responsibilities and who's accessing what data, what time, and why, right? So um, roles are real world representatives of actual responsibilities. So instead of thinking about a user in a context, you literally break down an organization on the roles. Um, if you look at it from a compliance context, and that's what I mean. Uh, if you look at it from a compliance context, um, you want to do strong identity management because this is actually division of duties, right? So if you look at it, uh, PCI, PCI, FFIC, uh, FINRA, SOX, uh, you know, whatever, Basel, all of those have some delineation that you have to make between different roles in the organization. Certain people cannot do two different roles, right? Especially if you're talking about in finance, uh, you don't want the same people uh, counting the books who are actually supposed to be checking the books, right? That doesn't that doesn't pan out. If you look at it from a trading perspective, you can't have the same guy doing the trades as, as the guy doing the clearing, right? Just a couple of different kind of access breakdowns. So you have these different roles, these different duties inside organizations, uh, and that's what the roles are, are there to set out. Um, again, just some general best practices around uh, role-based asset access control. You have to have the strong identity management. Most people will do multi-factor these days. That's why everybody has that little fob that says RSA on it or, or the like, right? Uh, or we're doing issued certificates, et cetera. Uh, audit, uh, auditing is actually pretty interesting. Uh, most people think that in auditing, you're looking to catch somebody or, or some uh, illicit piece of code using somebody's identity. Actually, the best reason for auditing I can come up with 
is to pull people's access for stuff they don't use. Uh, you're doing them a favor. Whether they realize it or not, having access to something that you don't use is an additional piece of responsibility that you just don't want to have, right? Um, number of effective roles, uh, et cetera, you can see how that would kind of fill in. Um, and then, like I said, there's a cultural shift that you really have to have in an organization to equate access to data to personal risk. I think this is going to come, become you know, kind of more and more of a thing when you start looking at big data in, in the enterprise. Uh, if you look at something at you know, Deloitte and Accenture and uh, McKinsey have released over the past, uh, past three months, they really think that um, digital trust is going to be a big wave that's going to be the enterprise this year. And so that's certainly going to impact the, uh, the deployments of Hadoop that we see out there. Uh, you have Apple. Uh, who's using their, their court case with the FBI just as much as, a, uh, as an opportunity to stand for their principles as they're using it for, for press. And you see a bunch of organizations kind of moving around the Apple bandwagon uh, as we speak. So digital trust is certainly going to be at the forefront this year. So uh, you know, kind of best practices like this, I think, are going to be talked about more and more often. So, the, uh, the access are control lists, typically. Uh, this actually goes back, by the way, Novell Netware. Anyone? Anyone? Novell Netware? Yeah, yeah, right? So Novell actually owns some of the original patents on access control lists and then the inheritance uh, capability of that access control. They actually did the original work around uh, essentially LDAP configurations and then being able to inherit principles and constructs around that. Um, I don't remember when the patent kind of slipped out, but I think it was somewhere in actually the early 2000s, but you see well before that Microsoft had, had glommed onto the patent and was actually using it in AD. Um, you know, obviously without protest of Novell, they probably didn't have any more gas in the tank to go after Microsoft at the time. Um, and so if you look at uh, the distributed file system that you're running underneath uh, Hadoop, typically that's, in this case, it's going to have to be HDFS because you're not going to see this applied with S3 if they don't support ACLs. Um, they're, uh, they're applied, they're inherited, and uh, you can set defaults. So if you create a directory structure, you can inherit uh, those principles down through the directory structure, and then um, they're, they're there as the default. So if you set an ACL, you're going to get above POSIX level permissioning, and then if Sentry or, uh, or any of the Apache tools that write on top, Apache projects, Ranger, or Sentry fail, uh, you get to fa fail back to the, to the ACLs. The problem with that is um, Sentry and Ranger cannot override the ACL. So if you set some sort of a permissive state or have some group conflicts, uh, the ACLs are in fact the, the base level of defense. So uh, you know, Sentry and Ranger can't provide more access than what the ACLs are giving Sentry and Ranger. So um, you have to be careful with, uh, with that piece. But we'll talk more about that here. My clicker batteries are getting low. So uh, I'm more of a top guy. I like just having a diagram up and, and speaking to things. Unfortunately, there's not any great diagrams for uh, either of the two projects. This is the best one I could find for Century. And since the, the same thing, the same architecture is, is actually exactly overlaid on top of Ranger, uh, I actually just augmented the Ranger slide that we'll look at here. So to kind of dig in, what you see is you're going to have, uh, to start out with, you're going to have some sort of a, a authentication methodology or paradigm user access control uh, that stands outside of the Hadoop ecosystem or outside of your distributed file system in general. Uh, you have to have a way of bringing that context into the cluster with Apache Century. So in other words, if you have Active Directory sitting outside of the cluster, you can actually integrate Active Directory with uh, Unix boxes fairly easily with third-party tools, something like Centrify, or um, there's a whole myriad of them out there. Centrify is the one that sticks out in my mind because they're the guys I run into the most. Uh, but with something like Centrify, they actually do PAM integration. Anybody PAM? Are, am I losing people with this or no? Active crew. PAM, are we, are we good or should I back up and explain what PAM is? All right, so PAM is uh, the basically permission authentication module that plugs into, into Linux, right? So Hadoop rides on top of Linux. Uh, if you have a shim that will basically plug into PAM and suck the, the permission systems, the user and access groups, uh, in this case roles, 
out of Active Directory, then you can pull that right into, into Unix, into Linux. And then when you go to use Apache Sentry or something like that, and you go to do a user sync, instead of using a user sync that looks like it's syncing against uh, an open LDAP directory that's hitting, uh, that's secured with Kerberos, it can actually uh, use the, the standard Linux uh, command line tools to be able to pull in and sync that user directory structure. So if you're using something that's going to go out to Active Directory for you and pull that user structure into Linux, you're actually going to end up with a much more robust structure in your Hadoop deployment, right? The reason for that is um, Kerberos can be nasty, so it's best to have that kind of that integration there, professionally integrated by a company that just does that into your Linux infrastructure, into your Unix infrastructure. Most companies of any significant size have actually invested in something like that. If you have Linux today uh, in your organization and you're doing authentication and somebody says that you guys use Active Directory, then most likely that's already transparently there and you just didn't know about it, right? So for this, we'll make the assumption that you're pulling the authentication in from Active Directory into your, into your Hadoop environment via via something like Centrify. What still has to happen there is this role sync process still goes on. So in other words, that role sync process has to go out for every single user that you wish to grant access in your Hadoop cluster, and it's got to pull that complete user's profile over, that complete user's role. So it's got to have that user, and then every single group uh, that they're in, and, uh, and any sort of default information or any inherited information that, uh, that surrounds that user. So that's pulled in, and when it says it's pulling it into Century, what it's actually pulling it into is to whatever SQL database backend that you're using to share, right? So that could be uh, MySQL, that could be Postgre, uh, some people who don't like themselves in their wallets use Oracle. Um, so you can, you can choose any real SQL system behind that, right? Uh, and that's where actually, when you say the, the policy metadata, Century, and you see how it's the database symbol. That's actually what it's sitting in. So it's sitting in a SQL database. Um, there are some there are some issues that we've seen there with customers. Uh, biggest customer to date that anybody knows is using Century happens to be eBay, and that's because they're contributing to another Apache project called Eagle. Um, anybody here a U of I guy? All right. Yeah. So U of I just had the folks from eBay in, um, and they were they had a hackathon on the Apache Eagle project, which actually uses Sentry under the covers. Eagle actually uses the audit trail that drops out of uh, Apache Sentry to do stream identification of issues. So you can set up different types of filters and you can say, uh, I want to alert if X, Y, and Z happens, right? Or I want to uh, notify somebody if X, Y, and Z happens. Or hey, watch out for this incident. Or hey, this should kick off a data governance pipeline, right? So all sorts of kind of interesting kind of stream processing pieces that that fall out of, uh, out of the audit trail. So anyway, the, the policy and metadata sits in a database, SQL on the back end. Century sits up front with, uh, with a gateway, essentially to accept uh, requests that are going to be coming in from any of these other plugins that you see up here, right? So Hive Server 2, Hive Metastore, Impala, Impala Catalog, um, Impala's front and center. The two that are actually mostly used are Hive and Impala. Um, very few folks are actually using Solar with Sentry. Um, the Hue Admin app actually sits on top and actually uses can use Sentry directly as its directory. Uh, Hue is only capable of using really LDAP as a, as a methodology for login. You can, uh, as of one of the later versions, actually log in hitting uh, local PAM off too, but most people are still hitting uh, LDAP. So it plugs right into Sentry. So when you log into Hue, essentially what you're doing is saying, I'm user XYZ for Hue. Hue, everybody in here familiar with Hue, right? Okay. So um, so uh, when you drop into Hue, you're identified as a user, so it knows when it kicks off a high pass, who it should send out that impersonation event pass, right? Same thing with Impala. It, needs, it knows who to send over uh, to Impala as, you know, who's running the query, et cetera. Um, the name node plugin uh, is actually there to be able not to provide any sort of permissioning construct, but it actually tries to sync back to, uh, to the metadata structure in HDFS for, uh, for ACLs, right? So if you looked at Century 
when it first dropped, when it first came out, like I said, you would see that Hive and the Hive Metascore, Hive Server 2, whatever version of Hive you were running, uh, even Yarn, which this is an old drawing, Yarn's not in here, uh, Century does actually support Yarn. Um, when, uh, if you tried to run anything that stood outside of those, it had actually no permissioning system. So you were, you were basically left to whatever the file system controls were. It was a huge, kind of a huge hit. So, oh, go ahead, Boris. Um, what's the permission on Hive? The permission should be on the date, and know what's on the query, so. Yeah, so that's actually what Century does, right? Century is going to actually let you do not only uh, permissioning on the files, but you can actually go into the data structures, so columnar structures in the file, and uh, set up an extra level of permissioning on those. So you could actually say, I want everybody in the, uh, in the data scientist group to have access to all columns in this table, and I want everybody in the market analysis group to only have access to the user and address uh, columns in this table, right? So the permissions actually do break down to high tables. Or if you're at Paula, you can break them down to specific tables, right? Or specific columns in a table. So it gets basically on par with Accumulo. Yeah, it's basically on par with Accumulo, or if you want to look at it this way, it's on par with what we were doing in SQL systems 20 years ago. Um, they're just basically trying to backdate to add that, that functionality in. People were used to having that into their infrastructure, and then they weren't. Actually, it's a, it's a really good point that you're making, because if you look at you know 20 years ago when we were doing something like this with Oracle, that data was wrapped up in a proprietary format and sitting on a file on a SAN, right? And so it was, it was relatively secure. You didn't have to worry about somebody going after that data with like an ls command, and then a cat command and reading that data, right? The problem that Century had early on was exactly that, right? It would secure the data. If, if you came up the data through Century, you were good to go through Hive, through the Hive Metastore, Impala, Impala Catalog, whatever. It, it was secure, right? But if you came at it directly with a with a Unix command, hitting it with something like a Hadoop FS LS, you could see the data. And then if you did a Hadoop FS cat, you could actually cat the data out. It was no more secure. So somebody could actually have run a Spark task on data that was completely locked up in Century. But because they had full access rights to it, they could still run Spark. They could still run Stormcast on it. They could still, you know, run the new streaming tasks on it, etc. So Century is trying to close some of those gaps with this Century plugin to the name node, which essentially says, take the role-based access control that I've structured for data and apply it at a file level to the ACLs. So it gives you a rough interpretation of basically what's going on with that file access from an ACL perspective. It interprets it to an ACL, and then it shoots it back over to the name nodes and, and says, hey, try and keep this in sync. It's best effort, right? The same thing kind of true, by the way, with the users. It only does a best effort uh, as far as keeping the users in sync as well. So you could see where somebody was uh, maybe fired uh, quickly, stinkly uh, for something. Uh, you can see that that may take hours uh, to actually propagate into the new system. So you kind of have to watch some of those edge cases uh, when you're using something like a, like a Century tool on top. If you're using the ACLs directly in HDFS, you'd be good to go, but because you're not, um, you know, that user sync process may take a little while and you may end up with some <coughs> permissioning kind of kind of left sitting around. Go ahead. So if I am securing HDFS, this seems to be the thing that makes the most sense because everything is going to HDFS. Uh, how do I pass through uh, the details of my application? So you need to extend my reuse model to be able to specify my credentials in my producer so that it knows who I am and allow me the appropriate access. So is there a plugin there that allows me to propagate my credentials to the hidden so for yarn, there is. It's not. Uh, I don't know if I added it to the diagram for uh, for Ranger either, but they did actually add a module for yarn. There is not one for task record, but there is. A I don't care about yarn because if I'm writing my reduce code, oh, oh yeah. okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So if you write the code, what actually happens is as you get executed as that user, yarn will pick off who that user 
So it will be fine by the user who actually starts the driver. Yeah. Which is picked up from the operating system. Yes. So this means that in the century, I have to include all the users allowed in my operating system. Yes. Yeah, and that's what that sync is. That sync is pulling in, it has to pull in everybody who's allowed to run a high query. It has to pull in everybody who's allowed to do anything with Impala. Think about if you're using solar. Solar search, man. Solar is way more accessible than SQL. Everybody runs a Google query every day, right? So solar is context search. I've seen organizations, especially in retail, they pass that to the whole organization. So it's no small undertaking to have to figure out a way to have a secondary sync into a separate database for all the users, right? It's, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to seem like I was downplaying that, right? Like that's a huge thing, right? That could be in, in an organ. I mean, I came from IBM, so that's that's like a globally distributed single sign-on system of of over four hundred thousand people, right? That's tough. That's a huge deal. Um, so having this separate uh, this, this separate directory of users is, is not it's not a small task, right? Uh, most of the places where I've seen using Century uh, quote unquote in the wild um, have been really small POCs um, or a really isolated group of people, which is fair, right? I mean, Century is Century is still incubating, so it's not like anybody should be sticking their foot in it yet, right? But uh, but that's that's exactly what I've seen, and, and so this whole model of of this role sync to me uh, it is one of the biggest drawbacks to Century, and the same the same paradigm exists in Apache Read, right? Uh, and the second biggest piece that I see that's kind of a pain is everything that you want to use has to have a plugin. Ugh. So Flink, this is a contributor for Flink over here. You should probably go ahead and write the uh, the Century plugin, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Spark. Uh, actually, I think uh, I think Cloudera is committing to writing some sort of a plugin for Spark uh, so that it can run. You could, I guess, technically use Spark on Yarn, pay the tax, the overhead tax, and the performance tax, and uh, and use Spark on Yarn and, and get the same piece. But again, you know, no small feat. So it's it's kind of the same thing, though, right? Uh, if we switch over to Ranger, you'll see. Or not. PowerPoint's going to be difficult today. There you go. So if we switch over to Ranger, hey Jim, Apache Storm's up here. There's a plugin for Apache Storm if anybody wants to use it. Uh, so if you switch over to Ranger, you see it's the same. Same Ranger plugins uh, for every individual tool that you want to use. Uh, there is a there is a plugin for Solar. I don't know if uh, I don't remember who wrote that one. Um, and then you still have to do this manual roll sync, right? It's, and it's not a trivial process. You, you know, you're really hoping you can keep that up to date. Kind of one of the, is there a question over here? No? So, um, kind of one of the interesting things as well is this only works on one cluster. So if you've got a ranger configuration or a century configuration, it only works on one cluster. Which is interesting because um, Apache Storm is going to be one cluster. Uh, if you're running it, and then Hadoop is going to be one cluster if you're running it. So I couldn't find anywhere to clarify or codify for me in the documentation um, exactly how that would work. I assume you're okay with Apache Storm as long as the same cluster that you're writing to is the cluster that Apache Ranger is managing. If you fit out, if you squeeze outside of that paradigm, you probably start to have issues, right? And is anybody looking at me like I'm crazy? Because why would anybody have more than one to do cluster? Thanks, Boris. Um, so, you know, before you go thinking I'm, I'm completely off the rails, uh, one project that I didn't include in either one of these slides is Apache Knox, which actually gives you kind of a, a restful access to your cluster. It, out of the box, supports two clusters. So, you know, if a lot of the other tools out there or several other tools out there are supporting <coughs> multiple clusters, why wouldn't Apache Ranger or Apache Century support two clusters? Uh, I'm not sure. And, and most of the customers I know of with, uh, with any significant instantiation of, uh, of Hadoop have more than one cluster. Um, that's just the way it goes.
Now, depending on what distribution you're running depends on what size your clusters are, but pretty much everybody who's doing something serious with Hadoop has more than one cluster. How many clusters do they have at Craft? Just one? How many nodes? Three. Really small? Are you guys running on laptops? <laughs> I've seen that. Is it virtual? It is virtual. There we go. VMware? Uh, no, actually, uh, I'm not sure about that. You're not sure about that? No. Just checking where you were with that whole Docker process, you know, up there. Uh, anyway, so so that's kind of, I mean, it, it's kind of the exact same slide all over again. What is interesting is you can see that there is an effort here with Apache Storm to kind of manage uh, streaming data. Uh, which is which is something new. So you see uh, some context for use around uh, the ability to manage data that's streaming into the cluster. It doesn't actually manage the data that's in movement. It actually only manages the data once it lands. So there's a plugin for Storm to make sure that it has authentication uh, or the ability to write to where you, the, the, the location that you pass it. Other than that, it doesn't seem like it does a whole lot of checks, permissioning checks, and the reason is Seems to seems to be worried about the, the delay. You have a question? Yeah, are there any plugins for Apache Kafka for setting up like a producer and setting up a topic and setting up a consumer and being able to access and control on that and see what's the security? Not that I've seen yet. Um, I will like, tell you when I'm like. Okay. Can you repeat it? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, he wanted to know if there were any, uh, any plugins for Apache Kafka. And uh, not that I have seen yet on either side. I actually would expect. Century because of its corporate backers to have that uh, before Ranger does, but um, obviously if they're using Storm or have a Storm plugin, they might they might write that as well. But uh, there does not seem to be one for Kafka yet, and, and that's according to either community site. Now maybe there's a maybe there's a closed source plugin if you go to Cloudera or closed source plugin if you go to go to Workmarks, but um, but I don't know. As of right now, there is not. Um, there, is, uh, there are instructions for writing your own plugins, and it doesn't appear to be too incredibly complicated. Uh, you define a, uh, a JSON profile to talk about the, uh, to describe basically the data that you'll be uh, ingesting or accessing, <coughs> the columns you'll be accessing, etc. And then uh, it looked like uh, maybe about 30 or 40 lines of code to basically come in and intercept the user uh, from whatever tool that you're running. Spark, uh, Flume, whatever, and then uh, take that user and then pass, pass it over to uh, some sort of an is accessible function, right? That would pass back the, uh, the privileges and then let you know how you wanted to handle it, right? If, if they had uh, permission, you know, you could proceed however, and if they didn't have permission, you could proceed however. Um, so in each case, <coughs> the plugins don't seem to be too enormously complex, though, based on you know, whatever you're plugging them into, you would probably certainly want to be careful about how you implement them from an architectural perspective because you could see a, a significant performance degree, um, right? <clears throat> Are there any questions? Anybody watching the storm? Is it is it raining yet? Tornado's coming? I have another question. This may be a dumb, this may be a dumb question, but how does this work with or complement curve curve? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. He asked, uh, how does this work with or complement Kerberos? If Kerberos is running inside on the cluster itself. Um, so for basically, the, uh, if, you, if you hear somebody talking about running Kerberos on the cluster, most likely they're using that to run encrypted communication between the cluster nodes themselves. Um, actually, Sentry and Ranger both play well in that paradigm. If you look at uh, what type of uh, communication they have going on back and forth to each other. It's essentially just an encrypted ODBC connection or JDBC connection uh, that's going to come from a plug-in into, uh, into Ranger or into Century. So that part's still encrypted. It actually does not ride the, the overall RPC protocol that you would see uh, encrypted by the native cluster communication. And then you would just be using the standard Hadoop integration into, uh, into Kerberos to be able to facilitate that. right? Um, now, from a practical standpoint, what we know is dangerously few people are, I shouldn't say dangerously few, uh, very few people are actually using any of those Kerberos feature sets uh, in production. The, uh, I've had a 
had a chat with, a, I don't know, maybe four or five customers who have, um, and they've all since rolled off of it um, if they were not on MapR. I mean, MapR actually has an option not to use to use encryption, but not to use Kerberos. So we have several customers who are doing that, but um, very few customers have I seen actually use um, Kerberos encryption if they're using uh, one of the other vendors. What's up? Uh, how does this compare to Identity Access Manager and AWS using EMR? So, um, it's very different. So Identity Access Manager in AWS is going to be, I'm oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question again. So he wanted to know how this compared to Identity Access Manager in uh, AWS if you're using EMR. So one big difference is going to be that the underlying file system is not the same, right? Out in EMR, you're going to be using S3 as your backed file system store, uh, unless you're intentionally making a move to set up a cluster and copy data out of S3 and then and into whatever group distributed file store you want to use, right? Um, as of right now, uh, I don't know that, I mean, there's really only two options out in EMR. There's uh, AWS's version of Hadoop and MapR. And I'm not sure that if you use the open source version of Hadoop that uh, AWS packages out there, that you can actually copy data, in, uh, large volumes of data into, uh, into HDFS anymore. I think they removed that ability because they, not for any other reason than it just made things easier to do, right? Because Otherwise, they had to attach you know, massive amounts of disks, and they didn't want to manage that extra piece. In fact, we were working with them to integrate MapR. They said, you know what? If somebody wants to move a bunch of data out of S3 and into their EMR cluster, we're just going to point them towards MapR because we don't want to manage uh, having those extra images out there. And you guys are willing to manage having images with a bunch of disks on them. So, uh, but aside from that, the Identity and Access Manager that's sitting out in AWS uh, is actually managing permissions on S3. So it's actually a, a completely different paradigm of security uh, that the Identity and Access Manager is implementing on, to be honest, somewhat of a black box permissioning schema on the backside. Um, I can probably dig into it and ask questions with the AWS team next time I'm talking to them, but off the top of my head, I would say that uh, the Identity and Access Manager is probably an open LDAP uh, tree structure. Uh, very similar to what we had talked about before with uh, inherited and, and role-based constructs to it. And that um, what they're doing is, is applying essentially an ACL model on top of S3. I'd have to see if it's actually got any more complex permissioning than just uh, a control list. Um, it's possible that they do, but as far as I know, it's just a control list. Any other questions? The question was if he's got some tables sitting on top of S3 and he wants to use Hive to query those tables, could he put in um, a, uh, a policy to manage those? inside of uh, Apache Ranger or Apache Century. Um, I've never seen anybody do it. In, in theory, there would be nothing stopping you, right? So what you would actually do is you would open it up so that uh, anybody could access the data out in S3, and then you'd put a policy on it uh, so that uh, Ranger or Century could manage access to it, and then somehow you would want to lock it down so that you could not get to the data any other way except for through uh, a high query, uh, which is the problem that people ran into before with, with Sentry and Ranger with just HDFS, right? Is locking it down, so that was the only paradigm to get out the data. Um, so if you could do that, uh, in theory, you it should work out fine. You can't, because uh, your enterprise security will cut all the parts of your body immediately. You can't open up uh, the pipeline. And this is what basically I'm suggesting. Yeah, well that's, I mean, that's what you would have to do for Apache Ranger and Apache Century to be able to grant permissions to them. So, um, and, you know, in theory you could work, uh, you could do it. Uh, in practice, apparently there's some mutilation involved. Uh, if you're willing to sacrifice <laughs> body parts, Boris says he can make it happen. Mutilation, yes, body parts, no. <laughs> uh, any other questions? All right, cool. So um, I'm going to 
move on a bit. I think I kind of kind of covered most of this. Uh, real world, real world application, like I said, that sync is really is probably the most itchy part. As Boris pointed out, that's uh, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of lifting. If you're syncing, uh, you know, I, mean, I think about one of one of our largest customers. They have, um, you know, they have 62 clusters. They have just 5,000 use cases, right? So if you consider even just 10 people are involved in managing or you know gleaning data from a use case, that's a lot. And so keeping that in sync uh, and trying to use Century or Ranger seems uh, fairly impractical. Um, their 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 paradigm is Yarn only. So unless you're using Impala. Uh, Pretty much all the all the MapReduce constructs you want to use are going to have to be handled through through Yarn. So if you want to run Spark, you can run Spark through Yarn and handle it. Um, if you want to use um, Hive, you have to run Hive through uh, through Yarn, uh, etc. Right. So those those constructs have to be you know are fairly fairly thinly constrained right now. The kind of last interesting piece is both Century and Ranger to close that gap that I mentioned before of not being able to use general ecosystem tools unless they have a plugin. They both started to write tools, uh, as I showed you, to sync to the name node in ACLs. So at the end of the day, both of them are going to fail back at ACLs. So uh, as Boris mentioned, your security team is going to come and audit you, and they're going to say, all right, fine and dandy. You have Sentry. You have Ranger standing out in front. I see that you're doing some of your column-based access control with that. Uh, what happens if Sentry and Ranger fail? Uh, they're going to make you put access control limitations on every single one of those tables anyway. So now you're managing two security paradigms. You're, you're managing your, your distributed file system ACL lists, and you're managing what's in Sentry and Ranger, and you're hoping Sentry and Ranger work because they're actually probably constraining your access control a little bit more, right? So that's, that's kind of the story there. We covered that. Um, Century and Ranger, neither one, as far as I can tell, have any documentation on how to support multiple clusters. So uh, back in the day when I was a Unix administrator here in Chicago, we, uh, we didn't have all these fancy tools to pull the users out of Active Directory. So what we did was we, we basically used Active Directory and wrote a script to, to query and create the users and groups permissions, and we parsed that all out. We, Put it into a cute little file, and then we copy that file to every single unit's host in the entire infrastructure. Right? We're kind of getting back to that model here, right? If you're using like Ranger or Century, um, where where you're going to have different users sync to different locations, and one day somebody's going to wake up and try and run something, and it's not going to work, and somebody's going to beat their face against the wall for a while, and then realize just like I did, you know, ten years ago, that ah. Oh, the user directory didn't sync right, or oh, somebody had a typo, or oh, I didn't parse right, right? And so you're going to run into some kind of, like I said, itchy issues around that. Uh, especially, the, I mean, we could actually run uh, mean time to failure models on it and probably determine uh, as your user tree gets a certain size, I'm sure there's a failure model that, that is just unsustainable. So uh, that, that seems to be the biggest shortcoming here so far. Um, Kind of a failure of vision so far of, of the tools out there. So you know we'll see. Um, if you, what's kind of interesting is the community itself uh, around Hadoop or distributed computing, I'll call it. Um, they don't they don't seem to have the same shortcoming, right? If you look at Databricks who's supporting Spark, if you look at the guys behind Flink, they're very much behind uh, the access control list of the core file system itself and not uh, some higher level utility that sits on top. Uh, and like I said before, uh, if you think I'm crazy for pointing out that Century and Ranger only support one cluster, or supposedly only support one cluster, um, not runs multiple clusters. So I don't know why you wouldn't want Century and Ranger who are authenticating nonce to be able to support multiple clusters. So uh, what do you do in the meantime? Uh, great quote here by Andrew uh, Buckhurst out of uh, GigaHome. Wait for the prize fighters to, to figure it out themselves. Um, I actually uh, am a pretty big fan of just falling back to the ACLs, 
Century and Ranger are trying themselves to keep the ACLs in sync, and as Boris points out, your security team is going to ask for a pound of flesh anyway and make you set up those access control lists in the first place. Probably worth your time just to have your DevOps team only manage the access control lists, right? Uh, focus on core security, uh, let the tools up the stack. If you've got a use case like Boris says for a Cumulo, that might be a good spot to go, right? That's, that's doing uh, cell level control still, right? Um, so you can do cell level control out in a, out in a Cumulo. Most people are going to fall to uh, column level control just as well. Uh, but, you know, driving further past that, uh, ACLs might be your best bet. Uh, as I said, you might lose that columnar level control in, in some of the file system pieces, uh, but you're going to gain uh, that consistency and that simplicity that you'll certainly lose if you move to, uh, to the two incubator projects today. <clears throat> like I said, I kind of highlighted it several times through here. Yarn's not a given. If you're running Mesos, um, these tools don't apply. Um, I would default to the Apples and HDFS because, again, they're going to apply across the board, right? Uh, whether you're using Yarn, whether you're using Mesos. Um, anybody in here familiar with the Intel Rhino project? There you go. You want to give a rundown on it real quick for us, or do you want me to do it? He doesn't want to give a rundown. So essentially, the Intel Rhino project, um, it's actually not that active. When I first saw what it was supposed to be doing, I thought, oh my gosh, they have to be so busy. Um, so the Intel Rhino project is, uh, it was launched under the, the theory that they could go out and actually start working on core security models and all the different Apache, Apache ecosystem tools, specifically as they relate to uh, distributed computing, uh, mainly the ones that, that ride on uh, HDFS or distributed file support, right? Um, to date, they've made a couple of uh, encryption uh, patches basically encryption packages that would tie certain Apache projects to a certain chip infrastructure. So uh, they haven't completed much much more much past that. So um, there's still hope there. Maybe the community picks up. The, the problem, I think, really with, behind the Intel Rhino project is um, I don't think there's enough of the community out there who really, uh, who really is focusing on the, on the security actual feature sets of individual community components as they sit. I think the reason for that is, uh, just as everybody in this room, uh, when Jen was doing his survey, uh, was asking about, I don't think anybody's really set on their core component of tools yet. And if they had, then they would be willing to invest more time in them, right? Uh, I do have some customers that I, I've worked with that, that know what their core component of tools are, and they've spent quite a bit of time with them, either getting to know them, or I have some customers who have their own versions of Hive, their own versions. Uh, of Spark, right? So they're very willing to customize the tools themselves once they land on it. And I, to be honest, because of the Apache license, I think some security patches that, or, or augmentation that folks have made may not ever move back out to the community. Not for anything malicious, just who has the time, right? Um, and then, as I as I point out here, as we prol proliferate tools, uh, you know, Jim talked about Spark and Flink. Uh, those are kind of the latest on the radar. But if you think about it, third-party tools too, right? Um, I don't know, how many people in here are running something on their Hadoop cluster that would qualify as a third-party tool? H2O, SkyTree, uh, Data Guys, anything? There was a hand raised back there. What do, you, do you mind saying what you're running? Um, <coughs> no, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, that's fine, that's fine, no big deal. Talent is another one. Um, I, I don't see any of these vendors uh, building a plugin yet. Not a, not a single one have I seen uh, do it yet. So we'll see how that. And, and it's quite possible because the two security tools are not out of the uh, out of the incubator yet. Um, but I also I don't think we'll probably see that until one of the tools emerges as, as kind of a standard. Right? We're in a what is it? Blu-ray DivX? Is that is that what Blu-ray was competing against? HD DVD. What's that? HD DVD. Oh yeah, there you go. So throwback machine, right? Or I guess I could just go VHS and Betamax since I actually remember that one. So anyway, once VHS and Betamax get done duking it out, then people will uh, people will probably kind of uh, or may uh, pick a pick a horse to ride. But the best thing overall to do is really to focus on the core security. Um, 
the ACLs are future proof, right? And so the ACLs, as we covered at the beginning, are basically role-based access control. Um, I, I really like Boris's point, I'm gonna keep going back to it, that even if you had Ranger and Century in place, you would certainly want to set up and audit uh, core access control lists throughout the entire distributed file store, right? Um, and the reason would be you have to know for sure that you, you have some stop gap. See, I was always fighting with the philosophical question. For starters, people invented Hadoop so that they can bring as many data as they can together and then run all kinds of interesting queries. And then they start to secure it to make sure that nobody touches my data, which is contradiction in terms with the initial idea. And this was always giving me grief. I mean, technically everybody is saying, oh, initial Hadoop design, never thought about security, it was an oversight. The way I look at it, it was never an oversight. It was invitation for people to share data. So, help me out here. What am I missing? Um, I think uh, from my perspective, what I see in, in the larger accounts is, you know, people are wanting to move the same data into the Hadoop ecosystem that they've had in their, uh, in their enterprise data warehouses for years and they've had to have the security in the enterprise data warehouses, and now the data has outgrown their enterprise data warehouses, and they're saying, you know, we want to glean bigger, better, faster insights out of this data. Um, you know, distributed computing claims to be the, uh, the answer to that, but I can't move this data in there unless it's secure. What happened to the dream? <laughs> Somewhere, Morris, there's 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 a hippie uh, comment. I believe Doug Cutting went to work for Cloud Era. <laughs> oh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jim Scott. <laughs> cool, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, but yeah, I mean, what happened to the dream? Well, um, the hippies moved off the commune and had to get jobs. <laughs> That's what happened to the dream, man. Sorry, sorry to kill your reality and substitute, but that's that's really where we're at at the moment. Um, but it, it, I mean, it is the case. I mean, I, I look at the customers that I was just at today, and they've got wonderful use cases. They've got wonderful insights. And to be honest, I came out of healthcare, and uh, you know, we're not going to be able to establish this next generation of accountable care without distributed computing capabilities. But we're also not going to be able to establish that without some level of digital trust either. So, um, you know, both communities are fighting and both communities are trying to innovate. And so we need both communities to really help each other out to, to drive innovation and get us where we need to be. Um, so, you know, I agree with Boris. It'd be great if we all lived in a world where everybody was, uh, you know, snowballs and ding dongs, but it's not where we're at. Um, so anyway, uh, ACL is kind of the, the kind of the kind of core piece of it. Um, map R, not really necessarily a pitch, but uh, ACEs are even better. We're supporting a boolean level logic for security. Uh, we're already seeing that that's been very core to some folks being able to drive to use cases they've never been able to facilitate before. Um, we're doing streams. We're doing tables. We're doing columns. Um, we're really hoping that the community can evolve to, to be able to catch up to us. Um, we think that those use cases are really what, what most people are really driving towards. Um, there's really only two commands to manage either one, whether you're looking at an ACL or an ACE, um, get and set. Um, and then if you do an LS in either one, uh, you're gonna get a, a, little, a little asterisk marker plus marker that's going to tell you that there is in fact uh, an ACL set or an ACE set. Very simple to interface with, very easy to script, um, very easy to understand, um, and then they both kind of kind of flush out to the end as to, to what the permissioning uh, schemas are. The difference between um, with the ACEs is essentially a Venn diagram, right? You can do intersections, uh, unions and not unions, um, with, with an ACE. So 
if you were to say have group A and group B with an ACL, um, and you wanted to provide access to uh, both A and B in the middle, right? You could provide an access control list. You could say, I want to provide um, access to both group A and to group B. If you want to say, I want to provide access to only the people who are in both group A and group B, do you know how to solve that in an ACL? Exactly. You write a script to iterate group A into a file, every single user. You write another script to iterate group B into a file, every single user. And then you cre create union A, union B group, and you add that to your role-based access control. Kind of hairy, right? So with, uh, with uh, Mapbar ACES, what you can do is actually just focus in right on the union of the two, right? Same thing would be true if you said, I want everybody, and here's actually a pretty common one from a, from a compliance perspective. I want everybody in development and everybody in the admin group to have access to a certain set of logs, but everybody in the project management group cannot. Now, if you put all three of those groups into, we'll call it project A, right? You can say that everybody in project A has access to all the data relevant to project A, except for when it comes to the log directory, if you are a developer or an admin, but not in project management, right? So it's those simple Boolean expressions, to be honest, that we use in search every day, right? That give you that extreme flexibility to be able to uh, kind of quickly get at the Venn diagram that, to be honest, with a straight ACL gets, gets a little hairy, right? You always end up, in fact, the answer with the ACL if you're like, I don't know how to do this, the answer is always create a new group. It's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple to come up with the answer. It, it's harder to come up with the group. And then uh, it's even harder. Boris left, but I'm sure he would say that your security team would do something with mutilation if you're creating those new groups. The administration is a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, once again, oh wait, I'm going to ask for questions. Anybody have any questions? Over here. Uh, in general, on the apples, what's the performance impact that start adding more apples or other apples? Uh, in, uh, in HDFS, uh, the, the performance plane is minimal. Um, when you say a bunch of apples, I mean, really, you're going to go to a specific point in the directory tree, in the, the name in the uh, metadata structure, and you're going to say, what is the apple on? So I suppose if you had, say, a 50, 60,000 group list, uh, you might see some significant performance degradation. Uh, but uh, I don't know anybody who's, who's done anything that deep or that complex with uh, HDFS hackles yet. Um, we're still just crawling out of the hippie commune days. <laughs> so uh, so people have not had you know, two expressive groups yet. There's another question right behind you. Uh, you alluded to Probably if you gave me another hour. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to come back and do a use case discussion. What I will cover from your question, his question was, could I describe accountable care since uh, I put foot to mouth? Yeah, and uh, how does this comply or is this compliant with HIPAA? And then, what was the last question? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, so basically the idea here is, um, okay, so accountable care. Accountable care is basically the ability of, of looking at healthcare from a holistic perspective and being able to, to look at a community of uh, individuals and then drive the most effective healthcare possible and not necessarily just focus on acute care paradigm. So in other words, focus more on preventative care, keep people out of the emergency room, et cetera. In order to be able to drive to accountable care, you have to have a lot more people accessing the data. You end up with people from a public health paradigm, uh, you actually end up, to be honest, the biggest one in accountable care organizations is all the field workers. The most effective paradigms around accountable care have shown that volunteers and field workers moving out and into communities are the people who are going to drive the biggest difference. 
So you're looking, to be honest, at, in a lot of cases, providing access to sensitive medical data to people who are, who are not necessarily always highly trained, right? And so what people want to do immediately in that paradigm is they say, well, if you've got five people on your docket, and those five people say that it's okay for you to access their medical data, we only want you to have permission to look at those five people, and we only want you to have permission to look at you know, five at certain aspects or attributes of that person's medical history, right? So very delineated roles. In fact, healthcare, from a role and access management perspective, is one of the hairiest harangues you will ever see. It's, it's atrocious. Um, now, does this address HIPAA? Does this address HIPAA compliance? So HIPAA compliance is actually a fallacy, and there's, there's talk now of actually making it a true uh, standard. Uh, really, it's just making a hospital lay out a, a privacy standard that the government deems accessible, and then making their patients sign off on it. So does this comply with HIPAA? Um, it could, but it could also not, right? Um, and I think that covers all three, right? So. Uh, but I'm, I'm perfectly happy to come back and do a deep dive discussion on distributed computing and healthcare because we've got several customers here in the area that can do it or are doing it. Uh, I was actually involved in, in creating some of the health information exchanges uh, that are out there today to facilitate Obamacare to begin with. So some of those, uh, you know, I'll call them itchy, hard, horrible, tough subjects uh, I've had to deal with uh, for reals, and it's tough. Any other questions? Florida has announced a record service. It's supposed to be. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Florida has announced something called a record service, which is supposed to handle this problem of having different access controls, you know, having sentry ankles. So that's supposed to merge everything together. Yeah, I covered that. Okay, so I. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, it, it makes it, it, it's the same same thing from Ranger. Ranger has the same thing. It's where it basically it, it, it drops a plug into the name node and tries to sync ACLs um, with uh, the role-based access control that's in Sentry and Ranger. So as long as, as long as that plugin stays in and up to date, some of the problems that people have seen so far is if the name node gets taxed, falls behind, uh, you start getting permission errors, uh, and, and it times out. So basically uh, it defaults back to the ACL for 60 seconds, and then uh, my understanding from the documentation is it goes wide open after that. So what I want to ask is, like, if in that case, um, it overrides the ACL access, meaning if I have access given through ACLs, and if I give access to record service, only the record service access will be in play. But if the record service service is down, the ACL takes over. No. If you have an ACL on it in the first place, uh, Sentry and Ranger cannot manage. It's, it's, it's just the ACL. Sentry, I understand, but I've heard record services the other way around. It takes precedence over ACL. Um, In other words, when record service is running, whatever access you give to the ACLs, it doesn't apply. And if that's the case, then the record service that you're talking about is not included in the Sentry package. It is not. So record service is something that Cloud Run just. So it's one of their proprietary yeah. features. It's it's they're supposed to. So it's one of their proprietary yeah. yeah, it was built on top of Sentry, but it's that's, that's what yeah. So it, it but it, it differentiates from Sentry in that way. That's that's the so main selling question. I would be concerned about how that's running because essentially that's a, a global user that's going to have complete permission over the entire uh, structure, right? So you're gonna you're gonna have a, a directory structure. You're gonna have HDFS, and, and you're gonna have one user that has holistic ownership of the entire directory structure, and he's going to be in charge of what you said, if I understood right, just flipping back and forth between Century and ACLs. No. Well, purpose is to not have any ACL at all. So, record service is going to manage everything. But if you have something, I specifically have this question to the cloud person, like, what if I have some ACLs remaining that was already granted before I switched on record service? Said that won't come into play when record service is running, but for some reason, if record service is down, if you have some ACL permissions left there, that will be in play. So that, that's get I, I don't know how that would work. I mean, if you look at it, in order for that to work, they'd have to wipe out the ACL and cache it, and then when record service died, it would have to reapply the ACL. So I, 
I don't, I don't know if maybe uh, I'm not understanding or if the person who explained it to you from Cloudera wasn't getting it. But once the ACL is gone out of HDFS, which it has to be for Sentry to manage that file, um, it's essentially uh, eliminated. Now you could put a more permissive ACL on the file and leave it and let Sentry or Ranger manage the file uh, to a more restrictive measure. And then if Sentry or Ranger fails, you would have at least a, a minimum level of, of security on the file. But it's going to have to be a pretty open ACL uh, to be able to, to access the data anyway for Sentry and Ranger. So we'll have to see. Maybe, you know, once more documentation comes out, we can, we can see what happens. Yep. So this is kind of backtracking a little bit on um, the statement you made earlier. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, just regarding Kerberos, I always thought Kerberos was more uh, used for authenticating users who are interacting with the file system. And you mentioned it was, in a lot of cases it was used to enable encryption between the nodes and, and the cluster. And I'm just curious uh, sort of how you've seen Kerberos implemented for what reasons, and whether it covers both of those, but, you know, other things as well. So, um, well, you got the question. Um, yeah, so actually what's going on there is each node in the cluster has to securely communicate with all the other nodes in the cluster. So Kerberos is the one doing the certificate management behind all of that to allow all those nodes to securely communicate with each other. So it's doing the, the ticket issuance to all the physical machines, but you're absolutely right. It's also there to authenticate the users. Okay. Um, all right. So that, that meshed encryption methodology is, uh, is uh, enabled by Kerberos. And you mentioned uh, a lot of people have disabled that. I don't know if you can talk about why at all. Uh, I didn't say they disabled it. I said they, they weren't using it. They, or they started using it and then they disabled it. Uh, and mainly it was because of failures. Like, things wouldn't work, period. Uh, you know, once you enable encryption and say everything has to be encrypted uh, when things start falling apart, uh, or you can't run a MapReduce task, and uh, your manager is yelling at you, the first thing to go out the door is security. So I'm gonna back there in the corner with the ACO question. Oh, nice. He caught that for everybody <laughs> on the record. Uh, he was he was all over it. Come on, Reddit. <laughs> I've got uh, I've got a ton of stickers up here too uh, for drill and for uh, Myriad. So I don't want anybody to for forget to go back uh, to their office and uh, start pestering their Hadoop administrators about Myriad because it's the latest and greatest. So everybody who uh, and everybody should want to put yarn in a box. Yeah, what's that? Put it on your box. No, no, put yarn in a box. Oh, put yarn in a box. That's Myriad true. Myriad creates a walled garden. Yeah. Everybody should put yarn in the corner. Is that the way it goes? Baby. Baby. <laughs> yarn, baby. I forget. Um, I'm going to ask a tough question and see if you can answer it. Yeah, I can't come up with a good one. All right. Um, which plugin supports Storm? Which security, I'd like to talk about, supports Storm? Ranger, I heard it up here first. He's, he's got a pen, but I'll go ahead and hook him up anyway. Don't hold that too close to your which laptop. Which supports it's gonna... multiple clusters? That was back here in the corner. I heard that one. <laughs> What does ASOS stand for? Oh, he didn't tell you. I didn't. Ooh, that's a failure on my part. Anybody want to guess? Oh, that's pretty close. Pretty close. Access control Emric, I like that. I'm going to go with that. It's an access control expression because of the Boolean case of the uh, he's got a pen. You've been looking at me funny the whole time, so I'm <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> um, oh, here's a good one. Since I'm staring at the answer, uh, what do you do if your access control list uh, doesn't support the granularity that you want? What? <laughs> <laughs> 
That's a good answer. I need something more expensive for that. <laughs> you know what? For that answer, I'll go with uh, I'll go with a Mac sticker. I think that's a good idea. In fact, I'll go with uh, a little a little litany of Mac stickers so you can give them out to all your friends.